Hello, and welcome to Read the Bull, the only podcast dedicated to finance and investing books. I'm your host, Stefan Prelog, and today I have a very special guest, John Hilsenrath, who is the author of the book Yellen, the trailblazing economist who navigated an era of upheaval. Welcome, John. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, and that word upheaval seems like it's uh, especially <laughs> pertinent today. Absolutely. So we do tape, but this uh, we're taping today. The Fed just had a meeting, raised rates a quarter basis point, and the uh, market had an interesting reaction. And I want to get to that because obviously the, f- the focus of your book is, is very central to everything that's really happening right now in the economy. So, John, you're a senior writer for The Wall Street Journal who, who writes about economics and finance. You've been doing it since 1997. So Janet Yellen mm-hmm. is obviously you know, a logical choice for a book, but for, for people who maybe, you know, don't read the Wall Street Journal on a regular basis and just know Janet Yellen, why was she such a compelling figure for you and, and why write a book about her? Well, I'd say there were, there were two ideas that came to me in November of 2020 after uh, Joe Biden was elected president and asked Yellen to be his treasury secretary. The first was that um, with that nomination, uh, she clearly became a really central figure in American economic history. You know, no person uh, in American history has ever served as a Fed chair, a Treasury secretary, and the president's uh, chief economic advisor as the chair of the Council Economic Advisor. And she had done all three. She was also happened to be a woman who had done all these, who had done all three and was the first woman to serve as Treasury secretary and Fed chair. So she was a person whose life, it, you know, struck me was worthy of examination. But then, you know, the, the question in my mind was, is this a story that people are going to want to read? And what I what I realized in, in thinking about her, actually, as many ideas, this one actually came to me in the shower almost instantaneously, was that there was a love story and right. that the love story became a vehicle for examining not only her, but something much bigger. So Janet Yellen's husband is a Nobel Prize winning economist himself, a guy named George Akerlof. And uh, they have an interesting, certainly high power relationship. And what I realized is that between the two of them, they've been in the in the middle of every major economic debate of the last 50, 60 years. And so I thought that with her as the central character and with her relationship as the kind of narrative thread, I could use that story to tell a much bigger story about the, about modern economics uh, mm-hmm. and what I say in you know the subtitle, Modern Economic Upheaval, because y- you talked about me being at the Journal since 1997. I mean, what I have done in that time at the Wall Street Journal, geez, I guess it's 26 years now, is, is really cover one financial and economic crisis after another. And these are two characters who are kind of present in, in all of it. So I wanted to use them really as characters in a big narrative. And I wanted to write about economics the way we try to at the Wall Street Journal and not the way it's taught in an economics class uh, in college. I, I wanted to tell stories with characters in a narrative that's approachable. And that's not just a bunch of, you know, kind of charts and graphs and theories that people can't get their head around. So that's what I set out to do. And that's what the book became. Yeah. And it's great. And for anyone, you know, if you're interested in finance and economics, you'll love it. And even if you're not, it's, it's a really great book because I think you do strike that balance and you started out with this kind of love story. And I was, it was very interesting because it it has really a narrative you know, thread to it. And then you understand why, um, given who her husband is and kind of how they came up together. And it actually, yeah. in the conclusion, you say, you know, Jalen Yellen's story was a story of two special marriages. Um, right. You know, one one was to her husband and the, and the other was a marriage of a market economy to democratic government. So, yeah. you know, it was kind of interesting the way you started that. So you say the idea came to you in, in the shower. So as you were you know, I always want to talk about the writing process a bit and talk yeah. about the reporting. Um, but was that your editor's idea? And how did kind of the how did you work with the editor? Kind of you know focus on kind of what the story would be and yeah. kind of the mechanics of so it. So there's there's a backstory there too. You know, um, at Wall Street Journal reporters and you know a lot of 
uh, journalists, I think, get approached by agents from time to time uh, who say, hey, you interested in writing a book? Um, you're interested in writing a, a book about this subject or that that you just wrote about in your paper. And I, I've been approached right. on many occasions by agents. And I always felt like I, I didn't want to write a book just for the sake of writing a book. Uh, I only wanted to write a book if I felt like I had a real story to tell that I could tell with some authority. And uh, that would be a story that I was comfortable with waking up with and going to sleep with myself for, you know, more than a couple of years, because that's how long the whole process takes. And, and frankly, you know, I had colleagues and rivals who've gone off and written books over at, at different times. And there were sure. times when they were off writing books and I was, you know, kind of still on my beat, breaking stories at the journal, you know, generating hundreds of thousands or even millions of page views. And I, I came to think, well, like, why would I go off and write a book, which is supposed, you know, supposed to be such a hard process when I've got a pretty cool job as it is. So my bar was pretty high and I was approached by an Asian, a guy at WME, uh, Jay Mandel, before this idea came to my head. I, I, I And he was a, he was a good guy. I, I really we had a, a cocktail in Brooklyn. We had we I enjoyed his company. But I told him, I was like, listen, I just don't have a book that I'm trying to write right now. I don't have one that's in my head. And he said, uh, you know, I'm not in a, in a hurry. Let's just kind of keep talking. And then sure. literally a month later, Yellen is nominated to be Treasury Secretary. A day or two after that, I'm in the shower and I'm like, oh, that's the book. And like it literally, the, the thing just came to me from beginning and end, the narrative, the concept, yeah. the construct. And so I, I went to Jay and I said, what do you think about this? And we, you know, we went back and forth a little bit on um, on a couple of things, but the proposal was written within a month. Uh, by I'd say by December, and I, you know, had an agreement with Harper Collins by January. So it, it took me, you know, like twenty years to decide on a book that I wanted to write. But then once right. I kind of decided, everything else happened pretty quickly. That's interesting. Like, so, the, yeah, the proposal and everything kind of came to, together pretty quickly for people. You know, and so, I mean, one of the important things for me, and this isn't going to be the case for everybody, was I just didn't want to write a book for the sake of it. Like, I would have yeah. friends say, you know, people outside of journalism, like, oh, when's your book? When are you going to write your book? You know, like, sure. kind of as if in order for me to be uh, like a legitimate writer, like I had to write yeah. a book, that that was like some kind of capstone. <laughs> And I sure. just came to think it like I was only going to do it if there was something I really felt invested in. And yeah. um, so I think one of the best things I did along the way was say no over and over again yeah. when I had these conversations. And I was like, I'm just not feeling that. Right. So once you got it, it was it was easy to to see it as a book. So that's that's interesting. So you've been a reporter for a long time. Talk a little bit about the writing process for a book and contrast a little bit with your you know, your daily job as a, as a Wall Street Journal writer. How is it kind of the same, different? Because you, you can tell it's, it's a well-reported book, but it does have a nice flow to it. On the reporting front, I was very married to the Wall Street Journal, to my identity as a Wall Street Journal reporter on, on two fronts. One is a lot of the material in this book is kind of based on stuff that I've covered over the years. I would say, you know, some large percentage was already kind of there in my head. You know, at least I had the framework for it and then I had to fill out some of the material. But a lot of the characters, Janet Yellen, yeah. George Akeloff, Larry Summers, Robert Schiller, all these people who you see, you know, who I who I kind of draw out as characters are people I've known over the years and just found yeah. interesting. And I just saw them as a stable of kind of bizarre people who I wanted to describe uh, as more than just some quote yeah. in a newspaper. On the writing part, that's where I would say, you know, and then like the ethos of a Wall Street Journal reporter, again, is like there's we have a value system that. Yeah. You know, you 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 don't re you, you don't write or report something without kind of checking with the people you're writing about to get their side of the story. You write sure. in a neutral tone, and and you give readers the space to form their own conclusions. I'm not like trying to convince anybody of anything other than the facts and other than a belief that I'm like just trying to get them closer to the truth. The part about doing the book 
that for me was one of the most liberating things was was the writing. I really enjoyed yeah. the writing part. And this is where I'm going to knock the Wall Street Journal a little bit. Um, you know, we're a very editor intensive newspaper. There are a lot of editors who have a lot of views and there's a lot of reasons for why we have that kind of system and value system. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed the autonomy that I had in doing mm -hmm. this. That was one of the things that that um, made me want to go write another book. It's just I had a chance to write, mm -hmm. you know, in my own voice without kind of being challenged with every chapter as is very, as happens regularly at the wall street journal. Okay. So your book editor wasn't as hard as some of your, uh, real life or not real life, but yeah, I don't want to throw anybody <laughs> under the bus, but, uh, it was, it was a pleasure working with Hollis who was my, my book editor. Okay. Well, no, it, it's a great book. It came out very well. So it was a good, good, good marriage there um, because it, it's a great book. You were talking about the economists that you find interesting. And I will say, you know, not everyone, you know, probably finds economics and economists interesting. And you did, you know, I, I'm in this industry, but I, I was even, you know, even more interested in kind of reading these stories and about these people that I have read about in articles and you know a little bit about their personalities, but you really brought them alive. And it's a really who's who of these, as you say, interesting cast of characters that have had different impacts on different parts of the economy and, and, and real life. And it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So like what, one of my favorite anecdotes, yeah. which I think illuminates this is Robert Schiller. Who yeah. was the best friend that's, of that's what I was thinking of. George yeah. Akerlof and very close to Janet Yellen. Like, this is a guy yeah. who won a Nobel Prize himself. This is a guy who kind of challenged um, conventional wisdom in economics and this idea that markets are efficient. Um, yeah. This is a brilliant genius person who discovered as a young boy, as a boy, that he had family living in Lithuania that he wanted to communicate with. So he taught himself the language and then wrote them letters in their language or who decided he wanted to uh, learn the Euclidean uh, geometry as a young boy and decided that the only way to read it properly was to, to read it in ancient Greek. But at the same time, this is a person who's so suspicious about being manipulated that yeah. one time um, he I tell this story in the book. Uh, he has a cat or had a cat and he, he was bought his cat food and it said gourmet cat food. And that bothered him. He was like, like, what's gourmet cat right. food? Who's to say what gourmet is to a cat? Right. And then so he decided he wanted to test whether there was any difference between gourmet cat food and regular cat food. So he started tasting cat food <laughs> to see if there was any difference. Like this is a guy who's so yeah. brilliant on some levels and so like – wow, you're just like different than the rest of us on yeah. another level. Yeah, that kind of sums up how maybe people think about economists, but <laughs> it was a great yeah, story. Yeah, but they are. They're, they're bizarre, <laughs> yeah. and um, many of them are kind of bizarre and fascinating yeah. characters, but they're also driving this machine that determines whether we're employed or whether our gas price goes from <laughs> you know $4 a gallon to $5 a gallon. So they matter. And I thought right. it was important to take people into the world and show – people that world yeah. that they live in because this world is like changing in ways that touches every American's life. Yeah. And changing so rapidly these days. And that's why I think it's interesting because you do show, you know, that's not just about these theories and, and people with these financial models, they actually translate to, to things that matter and things that impact us on a, on a daily basis. So that was really interesting. And I, I really appreciate that because it, it's not a book, you know, you know, about dry economists and, and teaching and all this stuff. There's a little bit of that. And I want to talk about that, but you know, the, yeah. it's, it's so much more. Um, so let's go back because, um, you know, we talk about these economists and their, their backgrounds and Janet Yellen grew up here in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Yeah. So, but kind of, uh, tell us a little bit about how her upbringing kind of impacted, you know, who she became. It had a big impact on, on her, on a, on a few levels. Yeah, w one of the, key characters early in the book is Yellen's mother, um, Ruth, who was a former yeah. school teacher and her father, um, who was a medical doctor. And um, Ruth was a very demanding mother on Janet and her brother, John, mm -hmm. and demanded not only that Janet get do her homework every night, but that it only be turned in if everything was correct. 
So Ruth double checked all of Janet's homework every night, all of John's homework. She battled with them. Ruth, you know, I got uh, some letters that John wrote back home when he went away to college and Ruth was so demanding. She corrected the grammar and the letters that he sent home. Uh, she was very particular about the writing. And Jan so Janet became someone who like the, the first step in the process of her becoming the economist she became was that she became someone who was obsessive about doing her homework and getting her answers yeah. right. Her dad was uh, a little kind of lighter around the edges. He also would bring home stories. He was a doctor, a neighborhood doctor, as you say, in yeah. Bay Ridge. And uh, he, he practiced in the basement under the family house in this three-story brownstone in Bay Ridge. You know, I, ironically, of course, Ruth had to make sure that the floors were spotlessly clean in his office. So she had her own buffer and she would buff the floors uh, in, in his office. But he um, would tell stories about his patients and the, the struggles that they had with right. unemployment and how it affected their lives and their health, their mental health, their family relationships. You know, they would also talk, tell some stories about the Great Depression at the dinner table. And, mm -hmm. you know, so she she took she developed this interest as a young woman and kind of I guess I'll, I'll use the word social welfare, the, the human condition. And uh, she went on from there. And, you know, she was very good at math and discovered that economics was a place where she could marry this interest in mathematics that she had to the kind of human condition and, and how to improve it. Yeah, I think that's always, it's interesting, obviously, the, you know, hearing these stories about people losing jobs and, and, and obviously it's a thread that you have in the book about how Yellen approaches um, employment and how she looks at it. She has, I think, kind of, you know, looks at it in a very humanized way in terms of, you know, these aren't just numbers, these are people behind these numbers. And so yeah. obviously there were some yeah. er early influencers around that. What, one little, another col colorful, anecdote that that's really a theme in the book is how organized she was and then you you know talk about how you know she would get to the airport hours early and then yeah. you return to that theme often so obviously you know it was a contrast with her husband where or, or I'm sorry someone she was um, working with actually she um, I think Larry Summers would get to the airport yeah. you know just within a few minutes you know, not like to waste time and her, it kind of was an interesting contrast, not just in how they obviously approached um, airport travel, but just about their, uh, you know, their professional yeah, lives Yeah, so there too. was like, there's kind of a bigger point in, in that, that anecdote about comparing and contrasting how Larry Summers deals with airports with how yeah. Janet Yellen deals with airports. So Yellen uh, doesn't like to take unnecessary risks. Yeah. Um, she, she, if she, you know, She'd rather get to the airport early, get to the big gate first and be sure she's, you know, kind of ready to get on the plane first. She's also a very competitive right. person. Um, Summers thinks that getting, you know, so her, her whole idea of going to the airport was about risk management, you know, diminish right. the risk that something you know, will go wrong by leaving early. Summers' view is that he doesn't like being in airports. He thinks it's a waste of time. There's a million other right. places he would rather be doing and, and, and places that he'd rather be and other things that he'd rather be doing. So his saying was that if you've never missed a flight, then you're spending too much time in airports. He was always rushing yeah. from the security gate, uh, uh, from security to the gate to catch his plane. And so it's a, it's a contrast in personalities. He kind of yeah. is a person who kind of just likes to um, – kind of play it close, but it also tells you something about economics, which is what I try to do in a lot of this book. And that's that there's this idea in economics that, you know, that humans are all the same, right? That we're all just trying to, it's called like maximize our utility, right? So when we go to the supermarket to buy oranges, we want to get the most oranges for the least cost. And, and it's a very straightforward and rational process, right? Right. But what you can see from the case of this this airport anecdote is that even for these two like super genius people, a simple issue like going to the airport is actually complicated. And what they're trying to right. maximize and what they see as being utility are two completely different things. And the, the point I'm trying to make there is that 
the, the world of economics is, is not this um, rigid for, formulaic world. It's complicated and it's populated by humans who are complicated and hard to decipher. And, you know, I think for me, that's one of the big lessons that I've learned covering economics all these years is like, you know, you, you, you take a class, you take your intro to macro class in college, and they've got all these kind of formulas and mathematical right. formulas, and they, they, they make you think that there's a precision to this. Right. And then when you look at the political debates, it's the same thing. You know, right. you're a Keynesian who's certain that the government has a role to play in the business cycle, you know, or you're a, a, a University of Chicago Friedmanite or a conservative, and you're certain that the government has no role to play in the business right. cycle. And it's just complicated. There's more yeah. to it, which is why I get to later in the book because a lot, I, I mean, a lot of the book is about teasing out all these inefficiencies, not only in the go in the markets, but also in how the government intervenes in the markets. That yeah. I, I come down to this conclusion that this marriage between markets and democratic government, it's a really messy process, yeah. and it's a process that's governed by institutions by uh, free media, by electoral systems, by courts, by police. And these institutions are the ones that hold it together. And, and what's happened in this last 25 years of, uh, of economic turbulence and turmoil is people have come to distrust these institutions. And, and like right. where I come out on this book, in this book is that to me, the biggest threat to the United States right now in our way of governance and way of life is that people have, are, are, have come to distrust the institutions that hold this precious marriage between democ democratic governance and market capitalism together. And the alternatives are not good. You know, look at Russia, look <laughs> yeah. at China, yeah. look at Iran, look at Afghanistan. The alternatives to what we have are dangerous. You know, even though our process right. is messy, we got to protect what we've got. And it's not a God-given right that will keep it. No, and it's we can get into a whole other discussion there. There's a little bit of a threat of, th to democracy, that's for sure. I think we could agree yeah. on that. But you get into a lot of different issues. But you're right, and there's and there's all there's a been and you you parallel because there is an evolution as you take us through the story. There's an evolution in economics and the time Janet Yellen. It was it, it seems like kind of a golden golden age of economics if if yeah. you know if I'm looking at it objectively um, and you talk about time, I didn't know all these different I knew some of these factions you had the free market you know as you say with versus the people who believe in some type of government intervention yeah. and they're held to these beliefs but there's a real evolution so as Yellen is coming up um, you know through her academic career and then when she you know becomes a professor um, she she fights uh, you know a lot of you know, you talk about how, you know, she's, you know, this woman who's accomplished so much. She also, you know, it came up in academia when a time it wasn't, you know, wasn't great for women, which I yeah. thought was interesting. So she had all these challenges and then she has this amazing flexibility. So, you know, you have, you paint all these, you know, you bring all these academics into the story and then all these interesting personalities, you get more of a sense of her personality, but it, it really centers around this flexibility. So how, where did that come from? And how do you know, how do you see that as, you know, as has it helped her throughout her career? You know, I, I'd say um, the flexibility. Well, so let me, let me hit on three things. So one is that flexibility yep. and where does it come from? But also, and maybe we can come back to this, but you also made mentioned a couple of other important things. One is how hard it was for a woman coming up in this field. Yep. And then the third was these great debates of the sixties and seventies. Let's start with the flexibility. I mean, a lot of that comes from childhood. Um, you know, her mother made her someone who was very intent on getting the right answer, you know, and, and what that required, like kind of looking at questions thoroughly um, yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and having the, 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 the rigor really uh, and the authenticity to try to get to the right answer and not the answer that you want. Right. Yeah. And then also, you know, the humility that I think comes from her came from her father, uh, the family doctor, uh, to kind of, you know, laugh at herself and accept when when she's made mistakes. I mean, I think those kind of core personality traits come come from her family, but it also comes from her experiences as as an economist, which, which 
relates to these great debates. You know, so the historical piece of this is we go through the Great Depression. There's this yeah. revolution in economics that's kind of started by John Maynard Keynes, who develops these ideas that when the economy gets like stuck in this, um, w- what was the Great Depression, in, in these uh, ruts that it's where it seems like it can't escape, the government has a role to play uh, through spending or tax cuts to try to restart the economic engine. Right. And, um, you know, a- after World War II, after the Great Depression, um, you have the rise of the Soviet Union, you, you have a, a, the, the encroachment of socialism into Europe uh, that started to really worry a lot of people. And there was a backlash against the rise of of, um, of, of socialism that was led by economists, including people like um, Milton Friedman, who right. were pushing for decades against uh, what seemed like the ever-growing hand of government, and mm-hmm. you know there was a there was a period, particularly in the '70s, where these University of Chicago folks really won the day because the government seemed yeah. to mess up everything that it was touching, including uh, causing inflation in the 1970s, and so there are these constant battles and struggles among the great intellectual giants of the post-depression era about, well, what is, and this is the marriage I'm talking about. What's the right Right. mix? How do you, like, how much government should there be? And and you have these intellectual battles. Um, Some of the the protégés of Keynes were, included people like uh, Jim Tobin, who was, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Tobin, who was Yellen's um, mentor at Yale. Right. So she became, like, literally a direct, uh, an heir uh, to the ideas of Keynes at a time when his ideas were being challenged by some really smart and aggressive people. And so she spent her career kind of navigating these intellectual tides in the early years. And in many ways, the kind of back, a backlash against the university of Chicago kind of happened in the 1980s where people, you know, the Chicago people said, well, the markets are efficient. Just let them do their thing and keep the government out of it. And right. then you had people like Robert Schiller, who I mentioned, and also George Akerlof, her husband, saying, no, markets actually aren't efficient. They're prone to all kinds of failure and disruption, in part because they're populated by humans, you know, who, right. who make mistakes and who lie and deceive and who kind of overreach. And then so th- this kind of backlash against Chicago wins a lot of intellectual wars. And right as Yellen shows up in Washington. Yeah. And what she's discovered as a policymaker is the government makes a lot of mistakes too. So, which brings me back to this ultimate idea that like we have this marriage between democratic government and and market economics, and it's populated by humans who are prone to all kinds of failures and fallacies. And um, I I think that's the story of her life is that she kind of traveled through both sides of those uh, of those failures. Yeah, that, that's great. And you, you bring it to a good point because she's maybe the most savvy politician without being political, if, if, yeah. if that makes sense. She doesn't like politics. She, she, right. she doesn't feel that she's good at it. She doesn't enjoy it. She feels, frankly, like there's an, an, an air, an air, an element of BS to it. That's uh, like kind of contrary to everything that she believes in. But if you want to be a policymaker, you've got to be in a political arena. Yeah. So that's been another thing she's had to challenge. She's had to navigate. And she has since um, she I guess her first role was with the Clinton administration. So talk about how, you know, she navigated because that was an interesting time, too. But talk about how she's kind of navigated the past few administrations, um, starting with uh, the Clinton administration. Well, her, I mean, her first experiences with politics were as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in the late 1990s during the Clinton years. Um and it, it, it really, frankly, shook her up. You know, she mm-hmm. found herself in the middle of these debates about the Kyoto Protocol, which was an, an agreement yeah. to reduce um, climate changing gas. And there were debates within the Clinton administration about how, how about what kind of promises they should make to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And there was like, you know, kind of environmental purists led by Al Gore. And then yeah. there were the economists who were like, all right, well, you know, 
you you can't do this without incurring some cost. It's not cost free. And so she found herself in these positions where there were environmentalists in the Clinton administration that wanted to you know, go to Congress and say, we got to sign up to the Kyoto Protocol. We can meet these yeah. emissions goals and it's not going to cost the economy anything. And she's like, no, that's just like that doesn't fit with my with the with the facts or the models for I have about how the economy works. And so like some of her toughest political debates early on were with people yeah. in her own party. And she didn't find it very pleasant. She didn't enjoy it very much. Uh, yeah. She was much more comfortable at the Fed, which was kind of more of an academic institution and and had enjoys more independence from the political process. So she she wasn't really striving to get back into politics. But as the Fed chair at a time, th- this was in um, 2014 to 2018, at a time when the Fed was under facing a lot of criticism, she was up in front of Congress on a regular basis trying to defend the institution. So she was yeah. again in the middle of political war. And then, you know, again with the Biden administration, and, and it hasn't been easy for her again right. in the political uh, arena. In the Biden administration, one example was these inflation debates. You know, the White House didn't want to acknowledge early on that its uh, um, uh, American Rescue Plan had anything to do with the outbreak of inflation. You know, they, they wanted to say it was all because of um, supply bottlenecks from uh, distributors of American imports based overseas. And it was amazing because at one point uh, she was asked, I think it was on CNN, about whether she was wrong about inflation. Yeah, And it was a fact that she was because she had said it was going to be transitory and it wasn't. And she said, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah. yeah. And like what was so remarkable to me was that that was news in Washington. It was news that a politician <laughs> right. admitted, admitted right. that she was wrong. Like right. it, 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 in that town and in the media landscape around it, you're, you're expected to BS your way through that question. And she just right. said which, what, what was obviously the truth. So but she's that surprise, always been a, but, kind of a fish out of water in the political environment. Yeah, I was just going to say, just on that point, did that surprise you, though? Because it sounds pretty, like, you read this book, and that sounds like something that, she, you know, you would expect. Yeah. I know it's surprising for a, a politician, but for her, it sounds pretty, pretty on No, that's completely, in, it's completely in character. And she did exactly what I would have expected her, she, yeah. uh, of her, you know, she acknowledged the mistake, but then she gave this kind of, this is why I think some people might look at her picture and be like, I can't read a book about this woman because, you know, then she'll give you one of her (laughs) answers to a question, you know, which could go on for 10 or 15 minutes and cover every possible angle of how she thinks about it. And it it, it can, frankly, it can be kind of exhausting for people um, to listen to her, but there's a human underneath it who's a really interesting character and who's obviously done really interesting things in her life. Yeah, and not to belabor the uh, the political point, but she is really a skilled politician because you detail how she would how she would approach building consensus and and getting her point across. And I guess it's a part of the competitive streak too. She wanted to make sure you know she you know she could win here and and get her get her point um, won when she needed to. Um, yeah. but it was just really interesting and and really particularly with Bernanke as uh, when she was vice chair, I believe, right at that yeah that time yeah. She and you point out usually vice chairs in this role don't have a lot of impact, but she really was kind of a guiding hand. And obviously Bernanke oversaw a very difficult time as yeah. Fed chair, um, but yeah. she really kind of guided him. I don't want to say she guided him. Uh, okay. Maybe because, that's too strong. You no, know, he's a kind of he's a brilliant guy in his own right who kind of yeah. had pretty good ideas about what he wanted to do. But I would say she pushed him yeah. um, okay. very hard. And she pushed the people around him at, at a time when the Fed was really divided about how to proceed. This was after the 2008, uh, 2009 recession. The Fed was trying to do policies to get the economy going again. There was a lot of internal resistance at the Fed. There was a lot of resistance yeah. up on Capitol Hill. And there was a lot of skepticism in markets about everything that the Fed was doing. And Yellen became really, I would say, a force behind the scenes pushing the institution yeah. to get behind Bernanke to do these things that he wanted to do and pushing okay. Bernanke to move even more aggressively. And, you know, this goes straight back to her 
connections to Tobin and her read of the Great Depression, that the, that the Fed couldn't sit idly by at a time when unemployment was so high, that it had a responsibility to, to do what was necessary. And she just didn't think in that moment that inflation was the problem that people made it out to be. Um, yeah. So she pushed the Fed to act. It's interesting how it played out because she was right in her prescription of the moment in the sense that inflation, we went a decade with very low inflation and unemployment yeah. gradually wound down. But then what happened was COVID hit. Uh, um, Trump had uh, not renominated her for a second term. Jay right. Powell became the Fed chair. COVID hit. And Powell took all the all the tools that Bernanke and Yellen had formulated yeah. in the post-crisis era and then and reapplied them in the COVID era. And it was kind of like, you know, uh, taking the wrong medicine off the shelf, giving giving a patient who's got hypertension steroids and, you know, and, and then you cause all kinds of, you know, side effects. Yeah. I mean, she's like you said, she's been in the, the center really here for a long time. But, you know, she basically oversaw, you say at one point, um, the a period where the economy was the longest period of economic growth in U.S. history. And she was yeah. there for that. Yeah. Um, and now it's now it's a different role for her as Treasury Secretary. So I, I, I want to speed up, I guess, a little bit to, to current day in terms of how you think she's in doing this new role. Because in the book you detail, like she, she again came back to Washington, probably didn't want to, but really and thought it was important enough that if they needed yeah. her, she would come back. Your point is right. She didn't want the job. Uh, yeah. When Biden asked her, what Biden's emissaries asked her, she said no. Uh, she's well into her 70s and she kind of was enjoying her retirement, by the way, making a, a good bit of money for the first time, right. giving advice and speeches to banks. She said no. And then they came back and, you know, this was in the middle of a, another moment of economic upheaval uh, triggered by COVID. And they said, we really want you. You know, we want someone who will be a stabilizing voice and presence. Yeah. And she went back with her her son. Robbie and George, her husband, and they literally talked about it in the kitchen. And they 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 all decided because many of her all of her big decisions are made with her husband and son involved. Yeah. They decided that she had a duty to take the job. So she chose to do it. Interestingly, a lot of people expected when she took it that she would do it for two years and then she would be gone after the midterms. Uh, she certainly, as I document in the book, and as a lot of newspaper reports have documented, she she had some tough moments in her first couple of years as Treasury Secretary, not only dealing with issues like inflation and building a sanctions re regime against Russia, but also, you know, once again, internal battles with the White House about what's the right thing to do on those issues or on issues like the debt ceiling. A lot of people thought that she was going to be gone yeah. uh, after the Mert terms. I will say the Wall Street Journal never reported that because, you know, our hunch and my hunch was that she was giving no indication that she wanted to leave. And as hard as it was, as hard as the job has been, in addition to feeling a sense of duty from it, I think she's felt a sense of of, of purpose. And, and she's also that straight A student who doesn't yeah. want to leave the job with an F on her report card. Yeah. And so she wants to see things through until inflation gets back down to some more manageable level. It's tricky. And uh, again, you know, we're in a period where, you know, the, the Fed pulls these levers and, you know, she's trying to help with the economy. But, you know, just really quickly, let's just I want to bring in Silicon Valley Bank and, you know, a lot of the criticism that the San Francisco Fed yeah. uh, is getting. And she at one point, you know, was the Fed chair um, that oversaw the, the Western region. So that would be yeah. under under her. So how do you think she's looking at what happened? Obviously, she's still has a role as a Treasury Secretary. But how do you think she's viewing what happened? Um, out in San Francisco. And, well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question because right now the San Francisco Fed is being criticized yeah. for being the supervisor supervisor of SVB Bank yeah. when it when it failed, right? Well, Yellen was the president of the San Francisco Fed in the early yeah. 2000s and it was super, supervising banks like Countrywide Financial, right. uh, which also faced a bank run. And which ended up being bought out by Bank of America when it was on the brink of failure. And so Yellen faced this criticism, too. 
The case was a little bit different because in the case of Countrywide, the, the CEO of Countrywide, Angela <laughs> Mazzillo, yeah. and I lay this out in the book, decided he was going to shop regulators. He was going to change his charter yeah. because the San Francisco Fed was pushing and the Fed board were pushing Countrywide uh, to improve its risk controls and increase their capital. And he said, I don't want to be regulated by these guys anymore. So he uh, became a thrift regulated by the Office of Thrift Supervision. Um, in terms of what she's thinking, you know, I, I, I'll tell you two things. One thing that she thinks and one thing that I think based on my reporting of both of these episodes. Yeah. What she thinks is that she does not want to go through another financial crisis. So when yeah. this run on, S yeah. on SVB happened, her instinct was we got to settle markets down right away. And so the first a day after it happened, the Biden administration agreed to guarantee all the deposits, right. uh, uh, all the deposit accounts in SVB uh, because and also Signature Bank because they didn't want to set off a panic and people running from banks in other in, in, from other banks pulling their deposits out. So it's absolutely her instincts from what she learned in the financial yeah. crisis were put to work. Yeah. Um, one of the lessons I take from having written that chapter on her and Countrywide was that, you know, the supervisory process is a very um, slow moving and rigid process. Uh, and and what, I, what I saw in that case is supervisors might see problems building, right. but it actually takes them time to do anything about it, in part because sometimes the bank that they're supervising doesn't want to do anything about it, and in part because they've got their own internal bureaucracies that they have to manage. Right. That, that absolutely was a case for her, and I suspect that's also – we're going to discover that was the case with the San Francisco Fed's oversight of SVB. You know, one, one other last point about Yellen's humility is she was asked by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission about how she navigated that period with Countrywide. Yeah. And, you know, they, they actually said, well, you seem to have seen the problems before others. And her and her response was, actually, I didn't see enough and I didn't do enough. And I'm yeah. sorry. You yeah. Know, that's, that's another thing you just don't hear in Washington. Like yeah. admitting – that you were wrong and apologizing for your mistake. It's like the way we're, we teach our children to interact with each other, yeah. but the people running the country and the people covering them kind of treat that as if that's <laughs> abnormal behavior. I know it's a, it's a little backwards. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is a little refreshing at least, but um, you yeah, know, I want to go back and, and, and I, I want to be sensitive of your time, but I, I just have so much that I knew I wasn't going to cover any, uh, all of it, but yeah. I want to go back because you talked about the beginning, you know, you had this idea, you know, after she was named treasury secretary and I imagine, you know, look, it's a, it's a big test to write someone, write, write a book about a bio basically about somebody like, like Janet Yellen, but, why not wait until, you know, the legacy is a little bit more complete? I'm curious why you wrote it at this period and didn't wait until, until you know, her term or, you know, her time was up in Washington. I mean, it, it might be because I'm a news guy with news instincts. And if there's yeah. a story there, I feel like I got to write it now. Okay. Um, so, you know, maybe uh, if I sell enough of these books, uh, I can come out and do a second edition that fills out the rest. But like now Got is it. when okay. she matters, right? Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, it's like in another couple of years, maybe in Biden's second, well, who, it, you know, either Biden loses right. uh, or doesn't run or there's no or there's no second term or there is a second term and she moves on. Yeah. You know, when she exits the stage, she'll be of someone she'll, she'll be someone of historical importance, but not necessarily someone who people meet who someone who that, that people should read about right now. Right. So I just, I wanted to do it. It was there and I wanted to do it. And, you know, my, my hope is that there's enough interest in the book that I'll get a chance to go back and take another bite out of it. And, you know, it, it, literally my hope this week is that I get to write another chapter on the collapse of SVB yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for a paperback or another edition. 
Yeah, I mean, there's so much happening. I think you have no shortage of material. Um, but yeah, just just on that that point, how much how much have you talked to her over the years? And did she, you know, when when she found out about this book, you know, what was you know, did how much interaction have you had with her before the book, and then once you were writing it? Well, I mean, I've known her for many years uh, from my time yeah. covering the Fed. You know, back to when she was president of the San Francisco Fed. Yeah. I probably even talked to her before that, back in her CEA days. I've also known George Akerlof, her husband, for many years. When he won his Nobel Prize in 2001, yeah. I was that reporter for the Wall Street Journal who called him up and said, how does it okay. feel to win a Nobel Prize? Oh, okay. um, You know, and I've had relationships with all of these characters, uh, sure. Larry Summers, Ben Bernanke, Robert Schill, you know, the Alan Greenspan. I've known them all for years. Yeah. I, I hope, I like to think... I built up some level of trust on their part that I'm going to treat them fairly in my reporting and writing. This is where kind of Wall Street Journal standards come in and how I and it, it affected how I managed the process of the book. It, it, you know, I wouldn't say this was an authorized biography in the sense that sure. you know, like I went to Yellen and said, is it OK if I write a book about you? Or she came to me and said, you want yeah. to write a book about me? Like this was me deciding I wanted to write this book. And then I let her know that I was writing the book and tried to get a sense of whether she was going to cooperate or not cooperate. Right. Um, so, you know, I spoke pretty extensively uh, to her husband, her son, uh, and, and had my meetings with her also uh, in reporting the book. But I also, you know, I talked to a lot of other people too. And I just, you know, I, I don't want people to feel like, I pulled my punches in, in doing this. this. The entire yeah. second half of the book is about stuff that's gone wrong when she's been in charge. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it's not like I made promises to her that I was going to leave anything out. Sure. Uh, in in order to to tell the story, I, you know, I, I tried to give a very thorough recounting of what happened during the financial crisis, what her role was countrywide, inflation, you know, all of these things. Okay. I mean, how would you right now, I know you, you, you know, you wrote the book, but where it stands right now, how would you summarize her legacy? Well, this gets back to the marriage point that I was talking about and mm -hmm. the fragile place we live in as a country right now, uh, where so many people distrust the media and the politicians and the courts and the police system and our, and our electoral systems and so many facets of um, the institutions that hold the country together. And I see that as dangerous and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I mean, th there are going to be people uh, who are on any side of judging her uh, for her ec economic beliefs, uh, for her stewardship of of. Uh, the economy and economic policy. There are going to be a lot of people who say that she's messed up a lot with inflation and, and, and any number of other issues. And there are going to be people who say that she was always on the right side of these debates. What, what I think really matters, actually, yeah. is that she was someone, in my view, whether you agree or disagree with the choices she made or the arguments that she met, mustered, I think she was someone who was trying to get it right and who wasn't playing a political game, yeah. who wasn't trying to at, at any point. She was not trying to get the next big job yeah. when she was the Fed chair, the, the vice chair of the Fed. She wasn't positioning herself to become the chair uh, when she was a governor at the Fed in the 90s. She wasn't positioning herself to become the chair of the CEA. You know, a lot of people go to Washington and their focus is on my next job. You know, right. how am I going to get, I'm a senator, how am I going to become the president? You know, I'm a congressman, how am I going to become a senator? You know, I'm the deputy assistant secretary, how am I going to become the assistant secretary? And that wasn't, and this is something that she, that I, we, she and I talked about and shows up in the book. She was, you know, when she got a job, she was just trying to do a good job at what she was doing. And, um, and I mean, you could agree or disagree with what she did. Sure. But. I, I, I think we need more people in the government 
uh, and in public life in any in every realm as a you know whether you're a banker or a journalist or a politician who are just you know just trying to do the right thing yeah. and uh, are, are thinking carefully about trust in the institutions that they're involved in managing because we've been through this period of 20 years where the American people have come to distrust our banks and and so many other facets of life I think Anyone who's leading these institutions, yeah. if they really want to be a leader, have to be thinking about how do I build trust in in in, in what it is I'm and what it is I'm doing. And I think that that mattered to her, you know, whether she did, you know, whether she made the right call on supporting the American Rescue Plan or not. She was doing it with, you know, because she thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great where place to end it. But I have to ask really one more important question, um, okay. John. What what's your airport style? Do you get to the airport <laughs> a few hours well, ahead? Well, I'll or, say like, this: when I was when I was a young man, I was definitely in the Larry Summers camp. Uh, okay. You know, I had no desire to be there, and I saw it as almost a challenge to like leave as late as possible. Yeah. Uh, but I think I've maybe become a little wiser uh, over the years and seen the merit of um, of getting there early. There's a lot I can do. This might also be because of technology. There's a lot yeah. I can do on my phone or my computer or with a book right. to keep myself occupied while I'm waiting for the, fl- the plane to take off. So I was a summer's. I've moved more into her <laughs> camp. But my, my nature, I think, is is more the risk taker. More the risk taker. Okay. Yeah. I really enjoyed the book. I learned a lot and was entertained. And I think a book about an economist and economics, I think it's a great, great accomplishment. So congratulations on the book. It's it's fantastic. Um, and uh, again, anyone who wants to follow your reporting, you've been there since 97, writing so many great stories covering the economy and, and broad, uh, broad sections of finance. And uh, so Wall Street Journal, Check out his writing. Um, John Hilsenrath, thank you so much for joining. That's your time on Read the Ball. Thank you for having me. It's been fun talking about it, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to do that. <laughs>